Hello, professional nurses. Mrs. Ignacio here. I am going to take you through chapter five, chapter five of PNR 104. So chapter five talks about assessment, data analysis, problem identification, and planning. Let's jump right in. So whenever you have a chapter, you want to look at the objectives. What am I going to learn as a result of going through this chapter? What are the most important points? What, what's the point of me doing this reading? What's the point of me going through this PowerPoint? So we're going to talk about the purpose of assessment, data collection in our patient. And we're going to talk about the three basic methods used to gather a patient's uh, data. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to differentiate objective data from subjective data, and that should sound familiar because that was also mentioned in Chapter 4. We're also going to talk about the sources of data, um, where are we actually getting this information. And in a clinical setting, we're thinking about... Um, I'm sorry, let me go back. In a clinical setting, we're going to actually collect data from a patient and document it, okay? So let's get to it. When we have an assessment, right, the nurse collects patient health data. We're asking questions, okay? We're asking on specific topics. You may do what's called a review of systems. And I think in class, I'm going to have that be an activity. where you are going to partner with someone and you're going to ask them questions about each of their 11 body systems and see if there's any abnormalities. So you can start with the sensory system. Do you have any visual impairments, any hearing impairments, right? So you'll go through each particular system and see if there's any abnormalities. And that is how you're going to be gathering information, putting it into a database and documented it and documenting. Now, LPNs can definitely collect data as part of the assessment. However, if this is a new admission, like in a hospital setting, that, <coughs> excuse me, that initial assessment must be performed by the registered nurse. Okay, so that's an important NCLEX point. Okay, now how can I approach the assessment? Well, we can look at uh, three different ways. A functional health assessment um, as formulated by Mary Gordon, or we can perform a focused assessment, which focuses on a specific problem or a specific body system. And we can also look at the basic needs assessment, okay? And that is based on Maslow's hierarchy. And I spent a lot of time in chapter four talking about the basic needs, the physiological needs, giving you the acronym pink scarves belong everywhere, so accessorize. So when you look at Maslow's hierarchy, pink stands for the physiological needs, scarves stands for security, uh, belong is uh, the belonging uh, esteem, uh, I'm sorry, it's the love and belonging level, that's the third uh, one up, and um, pink scars belong everywhere, so that's pink scars belong everywhere, so that's going to be your esteem, and then so accessorized is going to be the top, okay, so that's your self-actualization. The bottom line is you got to look at Maslow and understand when we say pink scars belong everywhere, uh, so accessorized, you're going to take care of those basic needs first, the lower level needs, and I think this is a good time. Let me just make sure that I bring because I think I missed um, one of the levels with my previous explanation. Let me just bring a picture up real quick to make sure that that is clear. Okay, so view this image. So here is uh, something I'm bringing into your view. Here is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we are going to meet the patient's bottom level needs first, the physiological need, right? And so that's your breathing, food, water, sleep, uh, you know, homeostasis, excretion, your airway, breathing, circulation. The patient needs that before they can have anything else. Like they need this to 
actually just be alive. Okay, so that's your pink. Scarves is going to be your safety. Okay, uh, belong. So pink scarves belong. That's your love and belonging. Okay, everywhere is your esteem. I think I uh, mentioned it. I wasn't correct when I said it the first time. So I just wanted to make sure that I show you this and, and say it the right way so no one will be confused. So pink scarves belong everywhere. That is your esteem. So accessorize is your self actualization and that is the highest uh, level that we can get to okay so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear all right let's get back to our slide and so when we think about functional health patterns how is the patient carrying out their ADLs? Are they able to function? Uh, are they, you know, able to wake up in the morning, get their breakfast, do, do their routine, get ready for work or for school or whatever activities they have for the day, right? So we're looking at those functional health patterns. Are they making healthy choices? Are they eating fruits and vegetables? Are they, you know, active or they're sedentary? These are all things that we're going to look at. When we think about a focus assessment, we are focused focusing on a specific problem or maybe a specific system. And that is going to be very appropriate sometimes. If your patient comes and presents to the emergency room and they say they have difficulty breathing, you better perform a focus respiratory assessment and also probably a focused cardiovascular assessment. This isn't really the time to <clears throat> worry about uh, the rash that they have on their knee. Now, the rash, of course, is important, but in this moment, this is an emergency kind of scenario, so we need to do a focus assessment, a focus respiratory assessment, and a focus cardiovascular assessment, okay? So uh, in that, there's a lot of times where a focus, <laughs> excuse me, assessment will be appropriate. So when we do the interview, we want to know that, okay, first of all, we're establishing trust in the patient and, and between us and the patient. So walk in uh, after you knock the door, be sanitizing your hands so they know that, okay, this is a clean nurse that provides a certain level of psychological safety. Introduce yourself because you know, that's just rude. If you dip, who are you? Like, hello, my name is Colleen. I'm going to be your nurse today. Okay. So you're friendly, but you're not there to be their friend. Okay. So you want to have good communication and you want to make sure that your verbal communication and your nonverbal communication are positive, pleasant. You want to make sure that you're paying attention to your facial expressions. If you're one of those people that you can't hide your, you know, feelings, you need to work on it because you can walk into the room. The patient may be in a bad state. They may be malodiferous. It may smell really bad. You can't go in there and be like, oh, my gosh, this stinks or like you look terrible. You can't do that. You have to get your poker face. So that's something that you may have to practice. So when we think about the interview, if there's people in the room, we want to make sure that is we ask the patient, is it okay if we discuss your condition with your loved one here? We want to make sure that the interview space is a place that is private, free from interruptions. The patients may disclose personal information and could be sensitive information. They may tell you that they survived a sexual assault. They may tell you that they're being domestically abused, right? There's a lot of things a patient could tell you, and we don't want there to be any interruptions. We don't want the patient's privacy to be compromised. So in the interview, the opening, is this when we establish rapport? So as soon as you go in, this patient comes in front of you, right? You want to make sure that that is a good impression, right? The first impression we want Want it to be good okay during the body of the interview that's when we're asking these open-ended questions so an example of an open-ended question would be tell me what brings you to the office today or mrs smith it appears that you said you're having some pain tell me a little bit more about that Okay, that's those are open ended kind of statements. Close ended statements are Mrs. Smith, do you have pain? Well, that's just a yes or no question. She's going to look at you and say, well, in her mind, maybe that's why I'm here. I have pain, right? And so the answer to that is yes. But you want to use those open-ended kind of questions so the patient can really start opening up. You can develop that relationship and understand what the problem is so we can figure out how to help best help the patient. Now, 
the closing, we're going to summarize the information. So Mrs. Smith, you're here because of the pain that you've been experiencing for two days and so on and so forth. This is what you've done to treat it. Okay, the doctor will be with you shortly. Okay, now <laughs> one of the ways that we can get information is looking at the patient's medical records. It's called a chart review. And so this is great because we have medical records in a clinical setting, um, especially maybe in a long-term care facility. You may have a physical binder that has these documents in it. A lot of places are now, or most places are now electronic, but the data collection tool, we're going to get information from the patient. The medical records, the chart, the chart is going to have a face sheet that has like the demographic information, the patient's name, their date of birth, uh, where they live, that kind of thing. Also, any doctor's orders, there's going to be nurses' notes, especially if you're a nurse that's oncoming, make sure you at least look at the nurses' notes for the past 24 hours because that's going to be able to paint a picture for you of what's going on with the patient. We're also going to look at the physician's progress notes. That's going to be telling us, okay, what is the main diagnosis? Why is the patient here? Is the prognosis good? Are they pending any tests, any blood work, any x-rays? Are they going to go for surgery? We can learn a lot from the physician's progress notes. The MAR, okay, that tells us what medications have been administered for the patient. And that's really critical because we need to know when was the last time that blood pressure medication was given? When was the last time insulin was given? And we need to know that because on our shift, I'm sure we're going to have to administer some medications, right? So, surgery, operative report, pathology report, how did the patient tolerate the surgery? Maybe the results of the pathology came back. And I will tell you that if the results came back and the patient, for example, has, you know, stage four cancer, it is not the role of the nurse to advise the patient of this. This is the doctor's responsibility. Okay, once the patient has been notified, then we can provide support, we can provide education, but it's not the nurse's role to provide that information. <laughs> Diagnostic tests, we can see what tests were done and what the results are. We can look at the admission history and assessment when they first were admitted to our facility. We'll see their fall risk assessment, their skin assessment. Skin assessment is the Braden scale most places use. And we'll look at the nursing care plan or problem list. Now, the, the nursing care plan must be initiated by the registered nurse, and then the LPN will be able to follow up with that and reinforce and continue with the care plan that has been initiated by the registered nurse. When we are physically assessing our patient, we are going to use these techniques. Inspection, okay, we are looking, okay, when the patient comes in front of you, you are looking them over head to toe, um, or when you walk into the room, you are looking, okay, inspection, auscultation, we are listening with our stethoscope, we're listening to lung sounds, we're listening to heart sounds, we're listening to abdominal sounds, we are listening, that is called auscultation, palpation, we are touching the patient with gloved hands, clean gloved hands, I should say, we are palpating, that can tell us if the patient has a tender spot, okay, that's going to be important. We are percussing. Now, LPNs really won't be percussing patients, but you still have to know what that is. When we are percussing the patient, and this is a skill that you're going to learn in lab, you're placing the non-dominant hand over the area to percuss. You can percuss the lung fields. You can percuss the abdomen. You place that non-dominant hand over the area. And then you will take the middle finger of your dominant hand and tap your middle finger on the non-dominant hand, that knuckle. And that is going to make a, a sound. So when you think of like the drums, you think of percussion, that's what we're, we're doing. So we're tapping with our dominant hand with that middle finger on the middle finger of our non-dominant hand that is lying on the patient, maybe their lung sound 
maybe their lung fields or maybe on their abdomen. And this is important because the sound that that particular organ makes can tell us if something is normal or abnormal. So if I am percussing the patient's lungs and I get a dull sound, that tells me that there is a mass there. Okay. Um, the only, so if I am percussing the right upper quadrant and I get a dull sound, well, that's normal because the liver is there. Okay. So uh, percussion can tell us a lot about a potential problem or something that's abnormal with the patient. When we are assessing our patients, we are carrying it out in a systematic fashion, head to toe. Okay, we're going step by step and we're looking at each body system as we go. When we're looking at the patient, we want to look at them. How are they breathing? Does it look like, <coughs> excuse me, are they coughing? Are they nasal flaring? Are they using accessory muscles? How is the patient feeling? What is their appearance? Are they dressed appropriately? Is their hair matted? Do they have on the appropriate clothes for the weather, right? What is their skin color looking like? Does their skin look ashen? Does their skin look dry, flaky, right? What is their affect? That means what is their mood? Is their mood appropriate? If they say, this is the worst day of my life and they start laughing, that's not congruent. If this is the worst day of the life, I might expect the patient to cry, not to laugh, right? So something is not quite right. And that could be a mental health <coughs> kind of scenario. Okay, when we think about head, we're thinking about the level of consciousness. Are they awake, alert, and oriented? Do they know their name? Do they know where they are? Okay, do they know the president, right? Are they able to speak to us? Or how are they communicating? What is their primary language? And what is the level of education in that primary language? Because that's going to be important. Because if a patient's primary language or only language is Spanish, if you get the interpreter and the interpreter's uh, translating, but the patient's um, you know education level is or second or third grade level, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if they're speaking in their native language, they need to really tone it down so that the patient can understand it. So they need to use terms that the patient can understand. Now, if an interpreter is being used, you still face the patient, make eye contact with the patient and the interpreter is in the background interpreting. Family cannot be an interpreter. An interpreter is someone that is um, given by the facility. It could be sometimes a physical person. Sometimes it could be over the phone. It could be a computer program, but Depending on your facility, that's the kind of interpreter used. The family cannot be used because how do you know the family is really telling the patient maybe they want, you know, grandma to die so they can get uh, their inheritance? Who knows, right? So that's really important to make sure that we use the interpreter and we have uh, the appropriate uh, kind of interpreter and in using it the right way. The mentation status, can the patient understand? Okay, can they comprehend? Are they able to form thoughts and communicate their thoughts? So we think of Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis has a condition where he has aphasia and a cognitive aphasia and uh, he has difficulty expressing his thoughts. Uh, and so if you have a patient like that, we probably that patient is not going to be the best to provide any health information. The family member, like the spouse, would be the best possibly, or maybe an adult child or someone who's taking care of this patient will be the one to give you the most accurate information. We're going to look at the eyes, the pupil size, right? Is one pupil larger than the other? If you look at the mannequins uh, in the lab, you will see that most of them have unequal pupils, and that's not a good sign. That's not a reassuring sign. When you are learning health assessment, you're going to learn the term perla, pupils equal round reactive to light and accommodation. So that is going to be important. Are both pupils responding to light? If I shine a pen light in one of your eyes, both pupils should respond. 
if that is not the case, we're going to have to further investigate because there could be a sensory issue. There could be a neurological issue. Uh, you could be having a stroke, right? So these are all important things. And you're going to get into that in a little bit more detail when you do your head to toe assessment, <laughs> excuse me, in the lab setting. When you're doing your head to toe assessment, that also includes your vital signs, your temperature, usually oral, uh, but sometimes it could be axillary temperature or even a rectal temperature. Never, ever, ever use a rectal temperature on anything except a patient's rectum, okay? Don't use that rectal temperature and take an oral temperature. Please don't. Uh, and never take a rectal temperature on a patient that is hemorrhaging from the anus. Like that is just not a good idea. Okay, so when we think about vital signs, take the temperature, take the pulse. That's why you have to have a watch with a second hand so you can actually take the patient's pulse and get their respirations, get their blood pressure. And, excuse me, you want to make sure that all of their vital signs are within normal limits. And pain is the fifth vital sign. Always assess their pain on a pain rating scale of zero to 10, zero being no pain, 10 being the worst pain imaginable. We're also going to listen to their heart sounds and their lung sounds. Uh, we're going to be listening for S1, S2 in the heart. That is your lub dub. The lung, we're going to be listening for vesicular sounds, bronco uh, vesicular sounds, or bronchial sounds. Those are normal lung sounds. And um, rails, wheezes, crackles, uh, ronchi, those are abnormal sounds or adventitious lung sounds. And we don't want adventitious lung sounds in our patient because that means something is going on. Okay, the abdomen, we're going to be assessing it. Is it round, protuberant? Is it hard, rigid? Do they have varicosities? Um, we're going to assess their bowel sounds, listening with our stethoscope. Uh, that's called auscultation. When was their last bowel movement? How are they voiding? How, what does their stool look like? It should be brown and formed. What does their urine look like? <laughs> Excuse me, it should be clear or straw colored, free of blood, free of sediment, uh, and it should not be mal or, or purulent. What is their appetite? Do they have any nausea? We're also going to be examining the extremities. Are they able to move their extremities well? Do they have full range of motion? Do they use assistive devices? Are they moving within a normal range? Maybe they can only elevate their arm to the level of their shoulder. They can't reach to the ceiling, right? What does their skin look like? Their skin turgor, that's when you pinch the skin above uh, the clavicle, over the clavicle, and it should go back down. And I don't mean you pinch them hard. You kind of just grasp it and let it go gently. And if it stays tented, that tells you that your patient is dehydrated. Now, that check for skin turgor is not the best check for dehydration in your geriatric patient because geriatric patients have a loss of elastin, collagen, loss of subcutaneous tissue. So for dehydration in our geriatric patients, we want to observe the oral mucosa, okay? Now, we're looking at skin turgor. We're looking at color. Is the color appropriate for the patient's ethnicity? If the patient has blue lips and blue fingertips, that's not appropriate for any ethnicity. That's telling me my patient uh, doesn't have appropriate oxygenation, and this is uh, probably a medical emergency, okay? <clears throat> What is the temperature of the patient? Are they warm and dry? Or are they flushed, right? What are their pulses, their peripheral pulses? And peripheral pulses should be checked. Both of them should be checked, and that's bilateral. And they should, we want the pulses to be strong. <laughs> We're looking for edema or swelling, right? We're also assessing, does the patient have any accessory devices? Do they have oxygen, chest tube, NG tube, peg tube, a jejunostomy tube, right? That's going to be a feeding tube that goes into the jejunum. Anything that the patient wasn't born with, okay? We're going to be looking for all of these things. Do they have a urinary catheter? If there's any 
anything that is connected to the patient, we always want to trace every single line from whatever it's connected to back to the patient. We want to make sure that those lines are free from kinks and they're not clogged. We're going to document the the drainage, so if there's a Foley catheter, if there's an NG tube to suction, anything that's collecting drainage, <laughs> excuse me, we're going to look at the amount, the color, the consistency, and we're going to document, document, document. We're also going to look at the dressings. We're going to look at the drainage. Now, if it is a fresh surgical bandage, for the first 24 hours, the nurses will not remove that. The first dressing change is done by the surgeon, okay, because they want to inspect the site. Is it still, are the edges of the wound still touching? And that means approximated. Uh, they're going to do that first dressing change. After that, then the nurse is able to perform all dressing changes. And if the patient has a dressing where they have to go home, of course, we have to teach the patient how to perform that dressing change and what the signs of infections are going to be and all of that. We also want to uh, do the pulse ox for a patient so we can find out <laughs> what the oxygenation is and if the patient has any traction traction is if the patient has fractures and these traction devices are weights that are hanging freely and on these pulleys if you walk into the room and the weights are on the floor you just can't pick them up and put everything back together because now the person the doctor the physical therapist whoever set up that traction device has to be the one to to fix it Okay, and again, it says the pain status. All right, so if you're assessing a patient in a long-term care facility, like they live there, right? Uh, when they first get there, again, that initial assessment is going to be done by the registered nurse, and they have periodic times where they're going to reevaluate the patient, okay? That is in your long-term care. <laughs> Uh, scenario, excuse me. Now, if, of course, the patient's condition is changing, <coughs> we may have to uh, assess them more frequently, okay? If it's a home health kind of situation, the RN has to do that initial assessment, then the LPN can then do the rest of the assessments. Okay, if there's any changes to the patient's condition, the LPN must report it immediately to the RN supervisor. Excuse me, when you are assessing someone in their home, you're not just assessing the patient and their physical body, you're also assessing the home. Is it clean? Is it free from hazards, scatter rugs? Are there children's toys all over the floor? Is it a hoarding situation? Because that can affect the patient's health, okay? So here's a question. As part of as an, an assessment, the nurse asks for information. <laughs> Of information uh, from the patient. <laughs> I'm very sorry. So the nurse asked for information from the patient and um, this information, a subjective indication of illness is perceived by the patient as an assessment, a symptom, or a sign. Take a minute to think about what the correct answer is. <laughs> if you thought to yourself, answer number two, you are correct. A symptom is what the patient tells us. <clears throat> A symptom is subjective, and this is what the patient perceives. Um, A sign is what we observe as the healthcare professional. So symptoms, subjective, sign is objective. All right, here's question number two. Okay, so all of the following components can be found in the patient's, <coughs> excuse me, chart, except the face sheet, the physician's order, <laughs> patient's history and physical, nurse's assignment. Take a moment to think about what's going to be the correct answer for this. <laughs> If you said number four, that is correct. The patient's nurse assignment is not in a patient's chart, okay? It's not in the patient's chart. So number four is the correct choice for question number two. 
All right, question number three. Linda knows as part of her nursing assignment that she is to review and update the nursing care plan on her patients. Is it hourly, every shift, every 24 hours, or weekly? Take a moment to think about it. If you said three, every 24 hours, that is correct. The nursing care plan is reviewed and updated every 24 hours. And any changes, of course, can be made at any time, but that is going to be the correct answer every 24 hours. So three is the correct choice. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. Let's look at the second part of this chapter, chapter five. We're going to correlate patients' problems and wellness issues with problem statements from the priority problem list. In a clinical setting, we're analyzing the data collected to determine the patient's needs, identify appropriate problem statements from the problem uh, priority problem list, and then we're going to prioritize problem statements. So here we are, we're going to analyze. And so we're looking for those cues, <coughs> excuse me, that deviate from the norm things that are abnormal findings, like your patient has a continual cough. That's not normal for a patient to be continually coughing. We have to say, well, what happened? Is this patient, um, maybe they have uh, cancer. May and of course, you're not going to say this, but this is what you're going to think in your mind. Uh, maybe the patient is having difficulty breathing. Maybe they're in respiratory distress. Maybe the patient is taking a blood pressure medication that gives them a, a dry cough. Maybe the patient is recovering from COVID, right? So these are all things, when we talk about these cues, whatever the patient presents with, you have to think, what is that related to? Is this normal? Is it abnormal? What could this thing that I'm observing or the patient is expressing, what does it mean? And how will I care for the patient using that nursing process? And when we analyze, we're looking at all of the data. How is it related? Is it clustered? Is there any missing identification of any missing information? Do I need to get further information? Maybe I have to ask these questions. Are you taking medications? Were you recently sick? Do you have a productive cough, a non-productive cough, right? These are all things that you have to think. And so inferences are made. That means okay, this patient has a cough, they have sputum that has blood, they recently went to an underdeveloped country, um, I'm thinking they may need to get a TB test, right? Um, you know, so we, we got to really think critically about what's going on with the patient. Now, our nursing diagnosis statement indicates the patient's actual <coughs> health status or risk of a problem the causative or related factors, and that is your related to piece, and then the specific defining characteristics. So in class, uh, we're going to talk about the PES, PES, and that is your problem etiology and your signs and symptoms. And that's how you're going to actually develop your nursing diagnosis. Okay, so when we talk about the etiological factors, what is actually causing the problem with the patient? Okay, so what is reoccurring with this patient. And that's, again, what the patient tells us are symptoms. And then you know, these abnormalities that we observe are going to be signs, okay? So when we think about the defining characteristics, they have to be, um, you know, present for a particular problem. So the fact that the patient is coughing, they have nasal flaring, they're using the accessory muscles, and they tell you they have difficulty breathing, those are defining characteristics of a respiratory kind of condition, okay? So that's what we're talking about, defining characteristics. So we're going to prioritize any problems that the patient has in accordance with their, pro with their importance. So a good way to think about that is, okay, uh, what is going to kill the patient the fastest? That's what we need to take a look at and we need to deal with first, right? That is what we're talking about.
And again, Maslow's hierarchy is at the basis of everything we do when we talk about prioritization in real life and for these test questions. When you see a question that says, what will the nurse do next? Then what will the nurse do first? Or what will the nurse's actions be? That is going to be a priority kind of question. Now, after the physiological needs are met, that is the pink and the pink scars belong everywhere, right? After those physiological needs are met, safety problems take priority because we always want to keep our patients safe. And you're going to see a lot of safety kind of concerns, especially in your mental health kind of scenarios. Now, every nurse must attempt to look at each patient holistically. So that means we're not just pushing pills. We're looking at the patient's physical status, their mental status, their emotional status, their spiritual status, if they have a support group. We're looking at their culture, their ethnicity. How does that affect them, their religious status? So, for example, if your patient is a, you know, a Jewish patient, please do not bring your patient bacon and eggs. If your patient is a Muslim female, please do not send a male nurse in to work with her. Okay, so these are things that we're talking about when we are caring for the patient in a holistic way. Okay, we're thinking about everything that could possibly affect the patient. So when we think about problem statements, what's <laughs> potentially something I need to work on as a nurse? In the long-term care setting, we're thinking about, okay, this patient is going to be here for the duration. So the initial plan, again, is initiated by the RN, the registered nurse. And then once that plan is uh, finalized, initiated by the RN, then the LPN can follow up with that plan. And remember, according to your textbook, this care plan must be updated every 24 hours. Now, in a home health care setting, problem statements must be identified uh, with the family's ability to cope. Can the family provide a safe environment for this patient? Does the family have awareness on their medical condition? Then this care plan in a home health kind of scenario has to incorporate, <coughs> excuse me, or include the whole family. Okay, here is another question. This is question four. And which of the following sets of assessment data is most likely to be present with the nursing diagnosis <coughs> risk for infection? So this is asking you, and you should always ask yourself this uh, when I see a question, what is the question asking me? The question is asking you, how is a patient that has infection going to present? What are they going to look like? Are they going to have fever, dysuria, change in urine concentration and urinary urgency? Are they going to have abdominal pain, sore mouth, hyperactive bowel sounds, and leukopenia? Are they going to have fatigue, EKG changes, dependent edema, activity intolerance? Are they going to have an abdominal incision, decreased hemoglobin, <coughs> and an indwelling catheter present? Take a moment to think about it. And if you ever see questions and you're like, man, I don't know what these terms mean, <coughs> excuse me, take some time and look these terms up. And if you look them up and you still don't understand, that's okay. That's when you bring those questions to class. In the beginning of the class, before the instructor starts lecturing, say, you know what, Mrs. Ignacio, Mrs. Hartson, Mrs. You know Patterson, whoever your instructor is, I found these terms when I was studying, doing my readings, and I, I looked them up, but I still don't understand. Can you help me? And I am going to guarantee you there's not a nursing instructor that's going to say, no, nope, too bad. Sucks to be you. They won't do that. They'll be so happy that you did the reading, you looked it up, and that you're asking the question. Okay, so for number uh, four, question number four, the answer is going to be... <laughs> um let me make sure that that's right the answer is going is going to be excuse me number four so abdominal incision that tells me that the patient actually had surgery whenever a patient has surgery i'm always scared of hemorrhage and infection 
<laughs> and hemorrhage is going to kill the patient the fastest, but this patient is at risk for infection because of the abdominal incision. They have decreased hemoglobin, right? That could uh, also be a sign that they have uh, infection. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and, or they're at risk for infection, rather. And indwelling catheter, whenever a patient has an indwelling catheter, they are at risk, okay? That, that doesn't mean automatically they're going to have an infection, but they're at risk. So let's look at why the other answers are not correct. Fever, dysuria, change in urine concentration, and urinary urgency. Well, this patient is not at risk. They actually have an infection. Whenever there's a fever present, I'm thinking, okay, yep, the patient has an infection. Okay, so the fact that two has abdominal pain, okay, sore mouth, hyperactive bowel sounds, and leukopenia, okay, this patient already has some kind of infection going on, and it seems that they have a GI kind of scenario going on, okay, a sore mouth, the, the bowel sounds are really uh, hyperactive and leukopenia is going on, right? So uh, this patient <coughs> already has an infection. The patient that in number three that has fatigue, EKG changes, something's going on with the heart. They have dependent edema, meaning that they hang down their extremities and they're, they're swollen. Their legs and ankles are swollen. They have activity intolerance. This is not risk for infection. This more sounds like a cardiac kind of scenario with this patient. Okay, all right, so let's continue. And so this last section of this chapter five, we're gonna look at appropriate problem statements. And we're gonna plan for the goals for these patients based on these problem statements. And in the clinical setting, when you're at clinical, you're gonna write specific outcome goals. Remember, SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and of a specific time frame. They could be short-term goals during this shift, the patient will, or long-term goals in the next two to three months, the patient will, right? So we have to make sure we're doing that. So when we are planning, we are looking at the expected outcomes. What is the goal for the patient? short-term goal. It could be in the shift. It could be seven to 10 days, but it's a short amount of time. Long-term goals may take a long time, may have to have rehabilitation, but we have to be very specific with, <laughs> excuse me, our goals. Okay. All right. Um, let's take a look at the interventions. Interventions, they're designed to alleviate problems and to achieve expected outcomes. Interventions, we're going to do something. We're going to implement something based on the patient's needs. So examples of interventions could be uh, monitoring high-risk problems. Maybe their blood pressure is not uh, stabilized. Pain, that could be <coughs> Alleviating pain could be something that we have to do. Reducing stress could be an intervention and maintaining skin integrity. <laughs> Excuse me. When we document, that is essential. If we do not document it, then it didn't exist. Okay. So we are not done until we document. I can't emphasize how important that is, okay? And the plan of care should be updated once every 24 hours. Again, the RN initiates the plan of care, and once it's in place, the LPN can follow that plan. All right, here is question five. Okay, question five, the last question, last slide of chapter five. A nurse has established expected outcomes for an assigned patient. The nurse carries out this important activity for the purpose of evaluating the occurrence of complications, measuring quality of care, measuring the effectiveness of nursing interventions, stopping care when outcomes are met. <clears throat> Take a moment and think about what is the question asking me? If I choose one, <laughs> is that really answering the question? If I choose option two, three, or four, 
So take a moment and think about it. If you said to yourself, three is the correct answer, you are correct. <laughs> the purposes of establishing expected outcomes are to direct our nursing interventions, okay? And so we want to maintain continuity of care and measure the effectiveness of our nursing interventions. So three is going to be the correct choice for number five, question number five. So this is a summary of chapter number five. Thank you so much for your attention. And remember, think like a nurse.